We continue our look into the languages and traditions of the First Nations peoples of North America, diving into what is colloquially known as the Red Record. This is Genesis Week. And a welcome again to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the origins controversy, made possible by you, the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education. A special greetings to our First Nations viewers, Bojo, Tansi, or Aingai, depending on which language or dialect you are coming from, thank you for joining us. Our creator did not say, come, let us be unreasonable together. No, rather, he gave you your brain and reasoning so that you may use it. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, we're coming to you all across the great expanse of Canada via cable and satellite on the Miracle Channel, down in true central Michigan on GNS TV, all around the world on the Genesis Science Network, and of course, via the internets on Rumble and YouTube. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can find us at genesisweek.com or my Rumble channel or on YouTube at wazulu.com. Today is Monday, January 8th, 2024. My co-host Al has a man cold this week. And while God has given me many gifts and talents, <laughs> In his infinite wisdom, he chose not to give me any organizational skills. And thus, I completely failed to arrange a live stream for this week. As a result, I'm your solo host this week, Ian Juby. In the last two episodes, Al and I ventured into the surprising connections between cultures literally all around the world, which all point to the biblical record of creation the fall, a global flood, the origins of languages, and the dispersion of the peoples from the Tower of Babel. We took a closer look specifically at the North American First Nations. We looked at the cultural storytelling of the First Nations peoples, such as the story of Nenebush from the Ojibwe and Cree, and the story of Turtle Island. The methods of sacred storytelling by the North American Indians was incredibly varied. Obviously, it was primarily an oral tradition. The elders would tell their people's legends and stories, but they also told the stories in several other ways, which you have probably seen in either not noticed or understood what was happening. Uh, putting the stories into song was one memorization technique, as well as chanting and drum ceremonies. Another method you've probably seen in historic recordings or enactments, reenactments, usually simultaneously with the oral storytelling, was that of the Indian hand talking. As the elders told the story, they would also tell it in sign language. This hand talking or sign language was used not only by and for the deaf, but Indians all across North America from different tribes, dialects, and languages. They were so well versed that the different tribes were able to communicate quite effectively with other people groups speaking a completely other language. This sign language was part of the Indian traditions that sadly the white man worked very hard to eradicate. Children in both the US and Canada were forced into residential schools where they then forced this, they were then forced to speak only English and not practice any of their Indian culture, which included speaking their native languages, hand talking, 
storytelling, chants, and drumming, all of that. I will leave it to the viewers to study this absolutely fascinating topic on your own, but I would point out, point you to archives like the 1930 Indian Sign Language Council, assembled by that guy right there, Major General Hugh L. Scott, specifically to record on film this universal sign language. 14 different tribes who spoke 13 different vocal languages were represented there yet all spoke and understood this common sign language. This sign language would actually be the foundation for the modern American sign language for the deaf. As the Indian elders told the stories, they would also sign it. This had multiple benefits. The story could be told to the deaf members of their tribe or to other tribes which did not even speak their language and it helped the listeners memorize the legends and stories. Now, while the meaning of many of the hand signs were obvious, some were, you know, not so obvious. For example, the hand sign for drinking or water, something very important, was signed with a cupping of the hand as if to drink water from a river. Now that's great and all, but what if you wish to communicate with someone who was not within earshot or eyesight? What if you wanted to leave a message on a tree or a rock for passers-by? It was an, actually an incredible, albeit erratic and eccentric genius by the name of Constantine Samuel Rafinsk, who first made known to the world what the North American Indians were doing. Their pictographs and petroglyphs were actually a depiction of this common hand sign language. For example, that sign for drinking water. It might be depicted as a line tracing out the arm and the cupped hand. The sign for daytime might trace an arc representing the sun as it crossed the sky from east to west. Nighttime might be represented in the opposite direction. You could also indicate the position of the sun in the arc to represent the time of day, like morning or high noon or evening. And so you have these ideograms that are depictions of this common hand talk the universal sign language of which a huge part of the North American Indian population was very adept. It was Rafinsk who brought the Wallum Olam to the attention of the world. Now, the Wallum Olam was a written record from the Leni Lenape tribe of the Delaware region in the U.S. This written record was composed of ideograms, which were based in this Indian hand sign language. So let's just read Rafinsk's introduction to the Wallam Olam as he wrote it in his 1836 book, The American Nations. Olam does not properly mean a writing since Lecky is book, paper, or letter in Lenapis, but it implies a record, a notched stick, an engraved piece of wood or bark it comes from Ol, hollow or graved record. Heckewelder says that Oluma Pasid was in the 18th century a king of the Lenapis on the river Susquehanna, who kept the Olam or records of the nation. It is probable that these were part of them. Sadly, the original Wallam Olam that Rifinks referred to were lost, but they probably looked very much like this replica. Now, as you can see, they were carved on birch bark and painted probably with the sacred red ochre. Uh, you'll remember from previous episodes, the reason for red ochre being sacred. This was the red earth from which the first man was created, hence the name red man which had nothing to do with skin color, but was based on the Indian creation account. This account 
bears a striking similarity to the creation account in Genesis, in which the original Hebrew words show us that the name Adam literally means red earth. This creation account is found in creation myths, legends, and accounts from Aboriginal peoples literally all over the earth, but especially here in North America. But coming back to the Walla Molum, you can see the ideograms or glyphs carved and painted into this birch bark sheet. Sometimes it would be carved and painted on the white outer bark. But sometimes, as was apparently the case with the Wallum Olam, they used the inner bark, which is typically a dark red color. This is why the Wallum Olam has also come to be known as the Red Record or the Red Score. In either case, both the inner and outer birch bark is so loaded with oils that it is not only convenient to write upon, it's got a pre-built in natural preservative. The Wallum Olam were ideograms carved and painted onto birch bark sheets and the medicine man or the people could read it or more likely they would chant or sing the records in order to more effectively remember them. Basically, the Wallum Olam is a song sheet. <laughs> the singing or chanting was a memorization technique. The ideograms were depictions of the hand signing of the oral traditions, and both the ideograms and the hand signing were memorization techniques. These ancient stories were so important, so sacred, that all this effort has been given by the ancients to ensure that these stories were preserved and passed on generation to generation. What on earth was so important that it was recorded through multiple cross-referencing mediums. This replica is of what Rafinks called Book One, which is the start of the creation story of the Lenny Lenape tribe. This practice of writing down chants and songs on birch bark is still being practiced today by many First Nations people, though the numbers are rapidly dwindling into extinction. And those who are practicing probably have no idea of the history nor the reasons why they are doing this. And may I suggest to you, the First Nations people who may be watching this, I would actually encourage you to learn these traditions before they are lost, because these traditions and stories become distorted with time. Those traditions will show you the path to your Creator which as you will see from your own native traditions, if you look closely, you will see that these paths all point to Jesus Christ as being that creator. But don't take my word for it. Look for yourself. Before we actually look at what's recorded in the Walla Mullum, I would like to backtrack for a moment to the previous two episodes of Genesis Week. You remember we noted the strange common theme of the turtle in flood legends and myths from around the world. Vishnu, the fish god from India. Vishnu is actually the name Noah. Vish is the ancient Sanskrit word for of the water and is where we get our English word fish because fish are of the water. Nu was another rendition of the name of Noah. So literally, Vishnu means Noah of the water. I pointed out how the people after the flood were dropping like flies and dying while the people who came off the ark seemed to live forever. Abraham was 117 years old when Noah finally died. Jacob was 50 years old when Shem died. Jacob could have gone and talked with one of the guys who was on the ark, someone who witnessed this great flood. But all of these people were dying quickly while the people who were on the ark seemed to live forever. Look at all the people who were born and died after the flood before Noah finally kicked the bucket. And so the people on board the ark were like gods. They never died. 
So the post-flood people deified them. This is where we get Noah of the waters becoming legendary Vishnu, the fish god. But you'll notice Vishnu is depicted as coming through that great flood with a turtle. So over here in North America, we see flood legends in the stories of all of the First Nations peoples. Here's the fantastic depiction of Nanabush from the Algonquin flood story done by First Nations artist Laura Dieter. Again, there's that turtle in the Indian flood legends. As I pointed out in previous episodes, it's remarkable that in the Seneca language, the word for turtle is Hanoa. But I'm not the only one to point out all these things. Rafinsk noted this way back in 1836. Tula is the ancient seat of the Toltecas and Mexican nations of Asia. The Tulan or Turan are central Tartary. In Lenape, the meaning is turtle or tortoise, names derived from Thor turtle in Hebrew, but all derive from strong and tall. Tulapin is the real tortoise of Lenape, meaning strong, manly thing. The water soft turtle is called Yunami. The Chinese, Hindus, etc. point also to a turtle as the Thibet refuge of the flood. Uh, as he explains elsewhere, uh, Thibet, which is probably pronounced Thibet, is the Ark of Noah. Notice what he says about Nana Bush. Nana appears Noah. His title of hair must allude to his long ears. All the Lenape tribes have tales and songs on Nanabush, which they venerate as a god. But his symbol is a turtle body with a large head and nose and a crest of feathers or hair on the head. Even back in 1836, Rafinsk, who did not perceive the Bible as literal history, was seeing stunning connections between Nanabush, the turtle, the hare, and the flood. So uh, just what exactly is recorded on these, on these birch bark tablets called the Wallamolum? Rafinsk actually had to learn the Lenape language and then the songs from the Wallamolum in order to translate them properly. Of course, there was you know, errors in his translations. I mean, he was the first to do this. No one had attempted this before. Today, skeptics loudly proclaim that the Wallam Olam was a hoax, which is odd considering that the modern skeptical claims were all addressed by skeptics back in 1885. Daniel G. Brinton held Rafinsk's original manuscripts and studied all the available information complete with compiling the expertise of several people. He addressed tough questions like, did Rafinsk make the Wallum Olam? Was it a forgery? Not only did he conclude it was not a forgery, but that the very mistakes Rafinsk made added to the authenticity of the whole record. Brinton added in his corrections of the mistranslations and some misinterpretations. Later on in 1995, David McCutcheon would recreate his own replicas of the Wallum Olam and compiled this fantastic book, which was really, really hard to get. Uh, this book was a gift from Julie Hedin, and I thank you, Julie. Uh, my fellow creationist, Tino Gropi, was mocking me for not knowing nothing about the Wallam Olam, and this has truly been a gold mine to me. So let's take a look at the Wallam Olam. This is Rafinsk's original manuscript showing the glyphs in order of appearance uh, on the Wallam Olam. Uh, McCutcheon methodically grouped them all together into chapters and books, and I quite like what he did. Uh, he explains his methodologies in his book, and I will use his system. The translations of the Lenape and the glyphs are my own, which are a combination of Rafinsk's original 1833 manuscript, Brinton's retranslation and analysis in 1885, McCutcheon's 
nicely done translation of 1995. And I tried to combine the translations of these three men in ways in which they agreed. If there was a disagreement, I used my own understanding of the glyphs, the Indian hand signs, and the arguments of the translators for why they translated each glyph the way they did. Bear in mind, the glyphs are not words, but concepts. Uh, one could describe each glyph as like an entire sentence or paragraph, especially when one considers that, like many other First Nations languages, Lenape is polysynthetic. One Lenape word is actually composed of multiple words all strung together, and thus one Lenape word can be an entire sentence in English. Uh, it's the same with the glyphs. So the first book starts off with the creation account. In the beginning, at first, sea water covered all the land. Above much water was a swirling cloud of fog, and within it, Manitou, the great creator spirit, moved. Primordial, eternal being, invisible, omnipresent, Manitou, the great creator spirit, moved. Manitou causes them much water, much land, much air and clouds, much heaven. Manitou causes them the sun, the moon, the stars. He causes all of them to move in harmony. Notice the path and movement of the moon is traced in this ideogram, as well as the sun. You can see the hand talking of the sun tracing its path, uh, rising in the east and setting in the west, only in this glyph they actually drew the sun and put dots for its path. Stirred to action, the winds blew hard, clearing the sky and the deep water, it ran off the land. And the last glyph in what McCutcheon divided into chapters is this glyph, which implies pure as snow, new islands arose and there remain, ready to be inhabited. So already you can see the stunning parallels with the biblical account of creation. In the beginning, the earth was formless and void and covered in darkness and water, and God moved on the face of the waters. The eternal, invisible, omnipresent creator. He created the water, the land, the air, and the heavens. He created the sun, the moon, and the stars, and caused them to move in harmony. Notice what it says in Genesis 1.14, that the lights in the heavens would be for signs, seasons, and times. Then, according to Genesis, after all of that, our creator separated the waters and the land, and the wall of Olam also follows pace in telling the same specific sequence of events. Now, we will have to pause there as I'm running out of time. We will continue this examination next week and look at the rest of the Wallum Olam. The Complete Creation video series is just that, an exhaustive look at the science, philosophy, and theology behind the creation evolution debate. In this 40-part series, Ian Juby walks you through the debate, starting with the philosophical premises and limitations of science, then the surprising history of evolutionary and deep time beliefs. You then walk through the evidence for creation from biology, geology, physics, paleontology, and archaeology. Chances are, any questions you have about the creation-evolution debate is answered in this video library. The series is both entertaining and educational, and suitable for personal study or homeschoolers. This 40-part series is available on a 20-disc set in either standard definition DVD or high-definition Blu-ray and is on sale now. Order your hard copies today online at our store at ianjuby.org. for me. Much to my pleasant surprise, we actually got a number of people already writing in regarding the Red Recordings project. And I thank all of you. Uh, while it wasn't anybody yet sending in recordings, it has been people 
uh, making suggestions or asking a question regarding different avenues of research. And I have to admit, you folks got my gears turning now. <laughs> uh, Deborah wrote in from Nova Scotia and because of copyright issues, I can't actually show you what she sent me, but she wondered if she had perhaps seen some paleo Hebrew characters scattered among North American Indian pictographs. So this is an intriguing question that while I'm skeptical, as we just discussed in this show, the pictographs are primarily based on the manual movements of the Indian hand talk. They are not letters per se, they are glyphs. It would be very much like seeing Hebrew letters in some Egyptian hieroglyphics. Sure, you might see that, but is it a paleo Hebrew letter or just coincidental lines making up the glyphs that happen to resemble the letter? What this does bring up, however, is the glyphs of the Mi'kmaq tribes out there in Nova Scotia and Labrador. They have written language as well, which like the, like the Lenape is glyphs. But there has been some pretty compelling arguments made showing striking similarities between the Mi'kmaq glyphs and Egyptian hieroglyphs to the point that the Mi'kmaq glyphs were literally called hieroglyphs. But we will get to that topic at a later date. For now, I am out of time. Remember those words of warning and hope from our creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. You can send your comments, questions, hate mail, and letter bombs to us in a number of ways. You can email comments at genesisweek.com, or you can tweet at genesisweek or leave a comment on CORE's Facebook page at CORE Ottawa, or leave a comment on the appropriate show available on either the Rumble channel, rumble.com slash user slash Ian Juby, or on the YouTube channel, which you can easily find by going to wazulu.com, that's Ian, and that'll take you straight to the YouTube channel. But just remember, these shows are now recorded live, so you'll want to search out the show under the Live tab. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org slash donations. Or you can mail a check written out to CORE. Canada North, Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. And thank you for your support.